And uh, yeah, so our first speaker is uh, Kayan, and she's going to be talking about QCD and the basics of uh, scattering amplitudes. Uh, so Kayan is a postdoctoral researcher at uh, the Max Planck Institute in Munich, and uh, we're very happy to have her here. Uh, so the floor is yours, Kai. I think you're, you're muted. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, can everybody hear me now? Yes. Yeah, thank you. Um, thank you very much for the introduction and um, the invitation. It is my great pleasure to be here. And uh, I will going to be talking about the um, connection, uh, scattering amplitudes and the connection to collider physics. So I am a postdoc, currently a postdoc, uh, working on scattering amplitude and also on QCD uh, in Max Planck Institute in Munich. And I'm going to start my faculty job uh, in China in about one month. Um, so during the past years, I have mainly been uh, working on the um, uh, collider physics, a precision prediction of collider physics observables, uh, where the scattering amplitudes in massless QCD and n equals four super young mills plays a central role. So on the one hand, scattering amplitudes um, tells us a lot, a lot about the underlying uh, properties of quantum field theory. Uh, in particular, in past years, it has been widely discussing n equals four super young mu theory and due to the enhanced symmetry uh, in that theory and um, many um, like fascinating and beautiful results have been obtained uh, by using the modern techniques, for example, PCFW and bootstraps and so on. Um, on the other hand, the scattering amplitude also um, it plays as serves as a key ingredient in the prediction of collider physics experiments. So the collider physics now has like a very general, it's a very general concept, which includes, for example, the high energy particle collider physics, uh, where we need to do the precision test of QCD so that the um, new physics signals could stand out. Um, and it also, in recent years, uh, interest in, in studying the so-called conformal collider physics has been reinvigorated. Um, then people have been working on the event shedding particular energy energy correlators, uh, which shed uh, the that sheds lights on the uh, light ray OPE and uh, some some central um, object subjects in the CFT. And uh, also like collider physics and, and observables can be extended for the studies of cosmology. Uh, cosmology, um, for example, people have been working on cosmology correlators, which is an analog of the event shape uh, at particle colliders. And so this is a very broad concept. Um, and so for, from our point of view, it is very important to ask the questions, what kind of uh, physical observables that we should study and measure which could uh, fit well into the quantum field theory uh, framework, which, who, which are of more theoretical interest. And another question to ask is, is it possible to apply these modern techniques uh, to directly applying these techniques on the study of cross-section level physical observables. So I will try to address these, some of these questions in my lectures um, in the school. So here are the outlines of my four lectures. The fir first lecture, uh, I will basically uh, do a little bit of review of the basic onshore techniques of scattering amplitude, including the BCFW um, color decompositions and the spinner helicity formalism. And the second lecture tomorrow, I will be focus focusing on n equals four super young mu theory and by introducing super amplitudes and super BCFW recursions. And I will illustrate how that recursion relations can be solved exactly to obtain the order tree level. Uh, and equals four super young means, uh, amplitudes in a theory. Uh, and I will also mention the connections between the n equals four super amplitudes and the amplitudes in massless QCD. Um, so the last two lectures on, on Wednesday and Friday, I will use um, some of the results and 
uh, and methods that I talked in the previous two lectures to apply them on the computations on some specific cloud physics observables. And so let me get to the get to my first lecture today. So I will start with a little bit of review of the spinner helicity formalism. Um, so we know that the scattering amplitude, um, we're what we're interested in is the scattering amplitude for massless particles uh, with spin, uh, for example, the gauge bosons and some fermions. And these type of uh, amplitudes are important for the study of high energy particles uh, experiments like the LHC, uh, where in high energy limits, um, all the mass goes to zero. So what can these amplitudes depend on? Well, it must be a gauge invariant quantity, which depends on the quantum number of the external states. Uh, and um, for the onshore external states, the degrees of freedom are the color and kinematic degree of freedom. Um, and for the color, uh, color degree of freedom, they, uh, they, 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 uh, that means they, 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 they are a form a uh, representation of the SU N3 gauge group and for QCD it's, it's SU3. And for the kinematic degree of freedoms, uh, we need to think about what are the suitable, suitable variables uh, to parametrize this onshore kinematic space. And the spin and helicity formalism provides such a unified description uh, to, to describe the momentum PI as well as the helicities or chiralities of the external particles. Um, so the way you uh, write down this formalism is the following. You write down the form of the onshore momentum PI of, all the, uh, of any external particle, and it, you can embed this for vector uh, by contracting it with the poly, poly matrices. And since um, the onshore condition tells us that this matrix has zero uh, determinant, and it must be able to factorize into a pair, one pair of chiral and anti-chiral spinners, lambda and lambda tilde, which transforms covariantly under the representation of chiral and anti-chiral uh, representation of the Lorentz group. And that um, these, these two spinners, lambda and lambda tilde, are determined up to a uh, overall U1 uh, transformation. And this generator of the U1 phase is exactly the so-called helicity, uh, helicity uh, generator. And we assign this undotted uh, chiral spinner with helicity minus one half and anti-chiral spinner with uh, lambda tilde with uh, helicity plus one half. So, in order to manipulate these uh, spinners and their indices, we define uh, some anti-symmetric tensor. There are two by two tensors for raising and lower the uh, dot and undotted indices. So the definition are given here. Um, and uh, so then we can raise the indices um, of these, uh, these matrix uh, given here. Um, and then uh, also raises indices of the of the two spinners. Uh, by doing so, um, we are able to contract one pair of uh, spinner indices. So uh, such so that we can write down this, this spinner pro product, uh, which are the angle and bracket uh, and a squared brackets uh, given here. And these uh, inner product of the spinners are Lorentz invariant. And they are the basic um, elements to write down uh, Lorentz invariant quantities. For example, the Mandelstam variables Sij are given by the product of one pair of uh, squared and angle bracket. And these uh, product in, in the product also satisfy this um, Schutten identity. So and what we are more familiar with uh, in the standard uh, QFT textbook are the four component Dirac spinners, as well as the gluon polarization vectors, which captures the uh, polarization degree of freedom of external gauge bosons. So, but these quantities have do have the nice the spinner representation. For example, the four component Dirac spinners for quark and antiquark uh, contain actually two copies of the chiral and antichiral spinners. 
they correspond to the left hand side and uh, left handed and right hand handed quark and anti quark field. And for all outgoing states, um, the chiral spinner, lambda i, uh, correspond to minus one half elliptic states. And the, uh, the anti chiral spinner correspond to the plus one half helicity states. And for the gluon polarization vectors, you can, it, it emits a bi spinner representation. Uh, which are given by this lambda lambda tilde and some reference spinners mu and mu tilde, um, and you can check ex explicitly that um, this um, the uh, the uh, the helicity uh, the helicity operator acting on these uh, uh, on this uh, polarization vectors uh, gives you extracts the helicities of the external states of the of the uh, gauge bosons, where the helicity operator are defined by um, uh, are given in, in the following. So you basically just need to count the power of the lambda and the lambda tilde in your expression to compute uh, to compute the helicity. So. Um, as long as the uh, uh, massless QCB amplitude is concerned, uh, or, or any generic SUC gauge theory is concerned, the amplitude can always be, uh, uh, must um, always depend on the lambda and lambda tilde. And they uh, contain all the information of unshared kinematic space. And the amplitudes must be an analytic functions of these spinners. So, we have talked about the uh, kinematic degree of freedom. Now we need to deal with the color degree of freedom uh, by using the color decomposition techniques. So this is a technique that allows you to disentangle the color uh, with the uh, kinematic degree of freedom such that the kinematic dependence of the amplitude becomes simpler and easier to, to reconstruct. Um, so the idea is the following. For generic Feynman diagrams, the, it depends on the color factor, which is a, which could contain the structure constant F, A, B, C, as well as the uh, T, A, T, B, T, C, which are the uh, fun, gen, color generators in the fundamental representation. So there is a way to uh, rewrite the uh, structure constant as a trace of uh, of uh, the product of fundamental uh, the generators in fundamental representation given by this equation, um, and um, we can use this equation to write the into three gluon interaction vertices as this the difference between two um, uh, two two terms where the first uh, each term is given by a single trace uh, of the TATBTC generators. Um, so in addition, um, we can use the so-called fierce identity for the uh, color generators uh, to con contract the uh, internal indices um, of in the adjoint representation. For example, we can uh, contract these uh, indices on the TAs, um, and then that allows you to uh, reduce these complicated color structures into this uh, simple case, which are made of two uh, two strings um, here. Um, so, so using these uh, two equations, basically you can do the color reduction for generic Feynman diagrams. Uh, such that in the end of the day, all these uh, color uh, factors can be uh, reproduced, uh, can be reduced to a trace of products of the TAs, where these indices A's are always contracted with the color indices of external gluons. Um, for example, here I have a five gluon scattering uh, diagrams. So you can, you know, do this color decomposition and reduction. And in the end, it will be reduced to a single trace of a product of phi TAs plus minus the permutations. Um, and also this in here, we have the, we have one pair of uh, fermions in, in the scattering process. 
and you can again do the cut uh, re re rearrange the FABC into traces of PATBTCs and then do the reduction. Uh, in the end of the day, the color structure is given by a single string of products of TAs uh, minus the permutation. So um, after the color decomposition, the, uh, the, the scattering amplitude that we start with are decomposed onto the so-called color ordered amplitude. And for pure gluons and scattering amplitude at tree level, and the amplitude can be given by the sum over the color ordered or the partial amplitudes um, times the color factor, uh, which are a single trace of the TAs. And you need to perform the sum, uh, all the non-cyclic permutations uh, of uh, the external indices. Um, so uh, by construction, this uh, uh, AN or the color ordered amplitude, it has the cyclic symmetry. And, and for QCD amplitudes with one fermion line, namely uh, one pair of quark and anti-quark, at tree level, uh, you can do the color decomposition and rewrite it as a sum over color ordered amplitude where the gluons are ordered with respect to each other, but not with respect to the, to the quark lines. And uh, the, the color factor is, is the, a single string or product of the TAs. Um, so in more complicated situation, we have more than one pair of fermions, then you have more than one uh, strings of products of TAs. Um, so let me summarize um, for the color ordered amplitudes, um, it can, uh, by, by the construction, we can see that it can uh, it has no color dependence and only the dependence on you know, external spinners. Um, and their helicities. And uh, in fact, it can only have poles in channels of adjacent, when adjacent momentum this, uh, goes on shell. So basically you can define a group of adjacent momentum and the sum of their momentum, so-called region momentum. And the amplitude only has poles when this region momentum P12 goes to zero, but it cannot have poles when like the P13, for example, um, goes to zero just by, uh, just by construction. So this makes the singularity structure of the color ordered amplitude simpler than the generic full amplitude and make it easier to construct. But later we will study how we can construct this uh, color ordered amplitude by, uh, by knowing the information about the singularity structures and analytic structures. And moreover, as long as the leading color uh, uh, component is concerned, we can, uh, we can compute the differential cross section, D sigma, by squaring the scattering amplitude and dropping the subleading colored factor terms. And the leading color contribution comes only from the squared of, uh, of each color order amplitude. And then you do a, a sum over all the permutations. So a leading color, the differential cross-section of the matrix n squared can only have poles when a uh, in, in certain channel where the adjacent, the sum of adjacent max uh, momentum goes on shell. So, uh, and it only receives contribution from each term only receives contribution from a particular cyclic ordering of eternal legs. Um, that gives us a way to write down like answers for the differential cross sections and uh, construct these um, the integrand for uh, phenomenological studies and which are much easier than computing all the amplitudes and square it and uh, sum over a large number of final diagrams. So that just a little bit of comment. Um, next, um, we we're going we're about to um, to to talk about what the amplitude can develop, what form the amplitude can take. So it will be very helpful to understand the symmetry properties of the color order amplitude. And um, first of all, it must manifest the global symmetries of the gauge theory. Uh, which in the, for the massless gauge series, these include the Poincaré symmetry as well as the conformal symmetry. 
So first of all, the amplitude, the color order amplitude itself must be proportional to if, uh, to the four dimensional delta function, which means the, color, uh, the total momentum is conserved. So by pulling out this delta function, uh, you can, uh, then we can talk about the symmetry properties of these, uh, this, uh, this function an, where the delta function is stripped off. So the Poincaré symmetry generators in spinner representation is uh, multiplicative. So it basically, you can do the Fourier transform of the translation operator, which gives you like a multiplicative uh, factor P mu, and you contract with the sigma mu mu. Um, this gives you the generator of the Poincaré symmetry. And this P uh, dot A equals zero is trivially satisfied because of the appearance of the delta function. Um, and then um, the, the, uh, in addition to that, you would have the Lorentz generator and mu mu. Um, again, you do the Fourier transform and contract with a basis uh, of uh, of uh, uh, symmetry uh, of, of basis of poly matrices. Um, since the mu and nu are anti-symmetrized, you know that the in the spinner representation, the R, uh, the uh, spinner indices must be symmetrized. Uh, you can actually verify this by doing a little bit of algebra using the field identity. So. The um, Lorentz generators in spinner representation takes the following form. It has the it has the chiral and anti-chiral representation given by the m alpha beta and then alpha dot beta dot. The explicit formula is in the following, and uh, and because of uh, you can check explicitly that um, the spinner product um, angle and the squared products are invariant under the Lorentz uh, transformation, since this uh, generator will annulate this spinner product. And this guarantees the Lorentz invariance of the amplitude as long as the function A only depend on the inner product of the spinners. Um, so in addition to the uh, Lorentz, trend in, uh, so Lorentz symmetry, you also have the conformal symmetry, which is the symmetry of the uh, Lange Lagrangian. So um, you, can, uh, you can write down the dilatation operator. In spinner representation, it just measures the, uh, the weights uh, in units of mass um, of the, your expression. Um, and uh, these Mm, dilatation invariance is a, a statement that the units of the uh, of the amplitudes a n is a constant and uh, given by this um, minus n times d zero plus four, where d zero is a is a constant to be determined. Um, in addition to that, you also have the special conformal transformation k mu, and in spinner representation is given by a two uh, a uh, differential operator, degree two differential operator. So how does this differential operator act on the uh, amplitude? Well, um, you can see that uh, uh, when the when this operator hits on the uh, on the delta four, uh, the, the the delta function, you can rewrite it uh, in, in the following way, um, and then you can reorganize these terms um, into this four terms um, well, where, um, so pay attention to, to this term here. So here it is a operator acting on the uh, amplitude a n itself, but you can uh, symmetrize, uh, you can rearrange these uh, terms in a way that it is, it is given by the sum of symmetrized and anti-symmetrized, um, sorry. <clears throat> uh, a pair of uh, symmetrized and anti-symmetrized terms. Um, so, yeah. So the first term is the um, Lorentz generator. 
And the second term uh, is a uh, one half of the dilatation operator, uh, which counts the overall weights of the of the uh, anti carol spinners. So uh, you can, in the end of the day, you can um, write this formula in terms of uh, the sum of four terms. And the first two terms uh, gives you like n minus four times n uh, times times the derivative on the delta function, and this term um, will just compute the overall. Uh, conformal weights uh, of the all the spinners and the last term is is the uh, conformal special conformal generator directly acting on the a n functions so uh, for in consist for consistency the vanishing of the uh, full color order amplitudes and um, in uh, by hitting onto the special conformal generator uh, leads to the conclusion that this D, D0 constant must be equal to one. And this, this A0, AN function is also uh, invariant under the uh, special conformal generation. So in, in summary, we can write down uh, a, a set of uh, uh, generators which des describe the conformal symmetries plus concrete symmetries in spinner representation. And these infinitesimal generators all kill the amplitudes, um, should all kill the amplitudes. And moreover, the spinner, um, the, the, uh, the color order amplitude in a particular spinner uh, configuration should also satisfy these following equations, uh, meaning that the um, the, it must be a basis in the eigenstates of the helicity operator um, defined here. So that's um, all the properties that the color order amplitude must satisfy. Um, in addition to that, the amplitude um, should also uh, admit a certain um, type of discrete symmetries um, just by construction. The first one is the cyclic symmetries. Um, meaning that the, 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 the amplitude is cyclic invariant. Uh, this comes from the, the way you derive and write down the uh, color, do the color ordered, um, you, you do the color decomposition um, where the color trace is cyclic symmetry, has a cyclic symmetry. And it also has a reflection symmetry, uh, which uh, can be derived by writing down a specific color order Feynman rules. Um, and that is come from the fact that the structure constant FABC is anti-symmetric. And then you also have the photon decoupling theorem, uh, which is to say that if you switch the, uh, if you sum over all the configurations where one particular uh, external gluon uh, are uh, are uh, located at different places, then the total sum is zero. This comes from the fact that the U1 gluon must decouple from SUN uh, gluons in the gauge theory. So if you have one additional U1 gluon uh, in the amplitude, then it must vanish. Um, so, or the amplitude can be, or color order amplitude can be organized uh, according to the uh, helicity configurations. Uh, so what type of uh, configurations that we can have? But first of all, we must note that if all the helicities are a plus or they're all minus, then the amplitude vanishes. And that comes from the, uh, comes from the, uh, the color ordered uh, Feynman rules where uh, you, if you can write down the, uh, the Feynman rules, you, you must notice that two pair of uh, gluon polarization factors, uh, vectors, must be contracted together. So if they're all uh, minus or all um, plus um, polarization vector, then you can pick the polarization, uh, th then, then the contraction must vanish. Um, therefore, these um, one must have at least one 
uh, polarization vector that has a, a, a different helicity. But if you only have one uh, different helicity, one different uh, one vector that has a different helicity, uh, it is not sufficient because you can pick the, for example, you have a um, negative helicity gluon um, one and all the other uh, gluons have positive helicity. Um, and then you can pick the reference um, reference spinner for the positive velocity um, gluons to be uh, P1, such that this P1 contracted with the negative velocity uh, vector vanishes. And therefore, so you must have at least the two um, uh, two negative helicity gluons and, and post, uh, all the other gluons are positive, or you must have at least two positive helicity gluons and the others are negative. So these are the so-called um, MHV, uh, maximally helicity violation amplitudes. Um, so the degree of helicity violation uh, counts the and the total number, uh, the, the algebraic sum of the external helicities, and this total sum, as I just argued, must be uh, less than n minus four. Um, so this also holds for the case where you have one pair of fermions. Um, in total, you must have at least the, the two minus helicity particles, and the others uh, are positive helicities, and uh, vice versa. So we have done with the general discussion of the properties of the color ordered amplitude. Now we're ready to proceed with some um, special, um, uh, specific examples of the amplitudes. And so the simplest this helicity amplitude that you can write down is the three gluon amplitude, um, where um, you have the two different helicity configurations, MHV and MHV bar. Um, Amplitudes. Um, and due to the kinematic constraints, the uh, kinematic conservation and onshell on uh, on conditions, and these to the fact that the product of the spinners of any pair of ij must vanish. So you have two possibilities uh, where either the angle bracket all vanish, um, and uh, the um, uh, in this case, you would have the uh, uh, correspond to the MHV amplitude, uh, we, which are given by this formula. And you can check that this, um, it is actually an eigenstate of the helicity operators. Um, and uh, the other, in the other case, the angle bracket all vanish, and the amplitude must be given by the square bracket only, then you have MHV bar amplitude, which is just a parity conjugation of the MHV amplitude. So these two amplitudes are the um, like basic um, building blocks um, for us to derive the more complicated and um, unparticle un MHV amplitudes. So now we will <coughs> come to the BCFW recursions. Uh, which is a technique that allows us to derive the um, form uh, the expression for the M point uh, scattering amplitude um, based on these um, the 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 knowledge about the singularities and the latent properties of the tree level amplitude. So um, the the idea is very intuitive, um, which is the, which you can visualize by uh, by drawing of Feynman diagrams. So the amplitudes and um, color order amplitude factorize uh, into, it, it develop poles as, as the sum of adjacent legs uh, goes on shell. And, and on the poles of these, uh, the, the amplitudes and the residues of the pole factorize into products over lower point amplitude. And here they're represented by the two sub amplitudes, and AL and AR. And, and the amplitude is, um, uh, <clears throat> and these two sub amplitudes are simpler. And by doing a, re a recursion, uh, by recursion relations, the more complicated ones can always be written as the simpler ones that we already know. Um, and the analytic properties of the amplitudes um, allow us 
to construct the amplitude through the recursion relations. Um, so uh, in more in more specifically, uh, we would like to consider a complex behavior of the amplitude under a complex deformation of particle momenta, uh, which uh, preserve the um, onshore condition and the momentum conservation relations. So for example, we can perform a complex shift of a pair of spinners at, um, like, for, at like one and n um, in the following way. And here Z is a complex the number uh, which characterizes the, the way you shift these, uh, these complex spinners. So um, after the, the, this momentum deformation, the amplitude A n is the holomorphic function of this variable Z. And um, it is also the, the deformed amplitude. First of all, it is still a color order amplitude and it still has poles as the region momentum goes on shell. And the location of these poles, uh, some of these poles are shifted uh, by uh, a, par a, a term that's uh, proportional to the complex Z variables. And hence this function A of Z develops simple poles in the Z variables uh, at various locations where these uh, Feynman propagators PI squared goes to zero. And you can find uh, the locations of these poles in the complex plan. Um, and then the, uh, the residues of the deformed amplitude at these poles must factorize um, into a product of the sub amplitude and each amplitude uh, are um, in, in these diagrams uh, correspond to the uh, a, 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 a amplitude here, which depends on this legs one um, through pi minus one, plus the, the leg with momentum pi goes to the right. And here the right sub amplitude depends on momentum minus pi <coughs> and the, <coughs> the momentum pi through pn. Um, so, and you also need to sum over the, uh, the intermediate state characterized by the spins or helicities of the inter internal uh, particle uh, with momentum p hat. So now you consider function is a n divided by n and uh, you uh, apply Cauchy theorem to this object uh, by doing these uh, contour uh, integrals of a n divided by n. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, along the uh, contour that uh, circles the origin. So these contour integrals picks up the residue of the origin, which uh, is exactly the unshifted uh, color uh, ordered amplitude, AN. And by Cursing theorem, uh, the, this object is equal to the residues the minus of the sum of the residues uh, in all the other poles in the complex Z plans. So these poles are located um, at z equals the i um, here, and then you can uh, you can you can compute the residues um, divided by z valued at z equals the i, which gives you this final formula, and um, it takes the form of the product of two sub amplitudes a l and a r, uh, and divided by the one over p i squared, where p i p i is equal to um, p one plus p i minus one. And in the end, you also need to sum over all the partitions of the, uh, all possible ways to partition the left um, sub amplitude, which is back to the right sub amplitude. So you need to sum from i, and the sum goes from i equals three to n minus one. So <clears throat> this is the final, um, final um, equation for the BCFW recursion relations. And in this particular example, we perform the complex shifts on like uh, adjacent legs one and n with minus helicity. <clears throat> of course, you can perform other <clears throat> type of um, complex shift and different shifts um, often leads to <clears throat> excuse me, different representation of the amplitude, but they're all equivalent. <clears throat> So 
Now we would like to uh, apply this um, BCFW recursion re relations to study the endpoint gluon amplitude uh, with MHV configuration. Namely, we have two minus holistic gluons and n minus two positive holistic gluons. So we place these uh, two holistic gluons at position n and n, and like n, um, and then we will uh, derive this general formula uh, using recursion relations. To start with, um, we already know that for an m equals three and a three point MHV uh, amplitude uh, are given by this formula, uh, which we already written down. Um, and assume this, this equation holds for uh, m equals three to n minus one, and then we would like to compute uh, the, the formula for m equals n uh, using the recursion relations. So basically, we perform the shift on leg one and n, as we, as, as we talked about before. Um, and then uh, we need to consider a, a series of, uh, of diagrams where this internal momentum p goes on shell. So there are only two possible diagrams, which are non-vanishing, uh, because <clears throat> if you have more than three legs on the, on the, left, on the left hand side, then uh, you would have a configuration where, um, where all the, uh, <clears throat> uh, where, where the, uh, the, the partial amplitudes uh, do not uh, contains um, less than two minus uh, helistic gluons uh, or two plus helistic gluons has must vanish. So you only have two possible ways to, to draw these diagrams. Uh, on the left hand side, you can have a, uh, gluon uh, with two, two gluons on the left hand side and n minus two on the right hand side. Or you can have n minus two gluons on the left hand side and two on the right hand side. But the second diagram uh, vanish uh, for the following reason because on the right hand side, this AR sub amplitude is an MHV bar amplitude where you have two positive velocity gluons and the one minus velocity gluons. Um, and uh, uh, as we as we talked about before, it uh, this MHV bar amplitude um, vanishes uh, if the um, it, it only exists if the uh, angle bracket of of all the uh, external legs vanishes. So for generic kinematic configurations, this shifted uh, uh, spinner product of n and n minus one. Uh, is uh, should not vanish because uh, remember that we perform a shift on these uh, chiral uh, spinner at like at position one and anti-chiral spinner at position n. So the chiral spinner at position n is not shifted. Therefore, this inner product uh, spinner product should not vanish in generic case. Um, this means this MHV bar sub amplitude vanishes, and you only need to consider this the first diagrams uh, where you have a two particles uh, on the left hand side. So the left sub amplitude is MHV bar three point amplitude, which you can read right down here. Um, and by our convention, is the minus p, uh, this uh, anti chiral spinner. Uh, with momentum minus p is, is a negative of the uh, spinner with momentum p. Um, so, and on the right hand side, uh, and the, the right sub, sub amplitude uh, by, uh, by the recursion relations, we assume that it takes this uh, general form. So, putting these two things together uh, and, and substitute into the BCFW recursion relations, you can easily show that the n point MHV amplitude uh, takes this following form, which is exactly the same as what we assumed, uh, which uh, we knew that it holds for the three point case. So we have generalized this expression to the n point case for the MHV amplitude. And you can check explicitly the dilatation operator acting on these MHV amplitudes gives you, uh, uh, gives you a minus 
um, n plus four, which which is a total unit, um, a plus n, which is the which comes from the d zero constant, and this uh, this gives you four times the MHV amplitude. And therefore, if you put back in the delta function, then the full amplitude is scale invariant. And uh, for, uh, for the special conformal transformation, obviously, since the MHV amplitude does not depend on anti curl spinners, the, it must be invariant under the special conformal transformations. Um, so, uh, some of you might be curious, what if we do not perform a shift on leg one and n, instead we perform the shift on one P1 and P2, uh, namely we, we shift this uh, one hat and uh, two bracket spinners. Uh, well, you, you, if you do that, then you would only have one uh, uh, diagram that does not vanish, um, uh, which looks like the following case where the left in on left and high you set, left hand side you have the mhv amplitude and the right hand side have mhv bar amplitude and by the same exact argument you can you can uh, argue that this mhv bar amplitude should vanish because with generic configurations the angle brackets two and three should not vanish and therefore this amplitude vanish uh, and the full amplitude vanish, uh, which is clearly a contradiction. Uh, but the way it happens, uh, the reason why it happens is the following. Uh, so when you consider it will perform the complex the shift of the momentum, you must uh, avoid a, a shift such that the amplitude, deformed amplitude develop uh, poles at z equals infinity. So if you do that, then you must also, when you perform the cosy, use the cosy theorem, you also take into account of the residue sets at infinity. So in this case, um, for the generic n point n retrieve amplitude, if you shift a minus, uh, the, the, the shift that uh, you perform the shift at one minus helicity leg and one plus helicity leg, you can do a naive power counting for this MHV amplitude, and which goes like v, v cubed as z equals to infinity. That means you must avoid such kind of um, BCFW shift. So in general, um, if you shift, uh, perform the shift on the, on the legs where you have the same type of helicity, or you shift uh, a, the, uh, the the spinners um, with um, uh, sh shift the chiral spinners with uh, on the leg with a positive helicity and anti chiral spinner on the leg with a minus helicity. Uh, these are all fine, and these you can uh, you're safe that the shifted uh, um, amplitude has a desired fall of property at z equals infinity. But this kind of uh, complex shift um, generally is not allowed. So for the exercise today, we would, uh, I would like you to uh, use the BCFW recursions uh, that I talked about to uh, derive the six gluon split helicity and MHV amplitude. Namely, you have three negative helicity and three positive helicity gluons in the external state. Um, first, you need to figure out how many independent partial amplitudes are, are there um, using this um, reflection and uh, cyclic symmetries uh, that we talk about today. Um, and then uh, uh, you, you, uh, you, I would like you to determine the one particular partial amplitude where all the negative helicity gluons are placed at the uh, at, at in the end at four five and six and uh, it is very convenient to perform a shift on leg one and six mm -hmm. um, and which will allow you to to derive the final formula uneasily so um, the last topic for today uh, is a extended symmetry of the pure gluon tree level amplitudes in pure Yamil theory, including the massless QCD. And in order to 
to to to go into details, I would like to first def uh, define the so-called dual coordinates, um, which is uh, so for the um, we define as pi equals uh, xi minus uh, minus xj, where xi and xj are if I are just a full component uh, vector. Um, and then uh, for these, uh, for a generic uh, amplitude where you have a, uh, a for the external particle, uh, external momentum PI uh, can be replaced by N uh, coordinates, XI in the so-called dual coordinate space. Um, and in this space, these, it has this, this uh, it, there's a cyclic, uh, uh, symmetry where you um, the x um, x one uh, uh, this space is parametrized by the n uh, variables x one plus x n and x n plus one is uh, is the same as x one. Um, so in that space, yeah, you can write down the represent spinner representation of the coordinate, uh, the difference of the coordinates x i and x i plus one, which are exactly the pi uh, given by a pair of uh, chiral and anti-chiral spinners. Um, so we can trade these uh, the pair of anti anti chiral and anti-chiral spinners with a chiral spinner and these coordinates in the dual coordinate space, xi's, uh, by applying these following equations, then you can rewrite these anti-chiral spinners in terms of lambda and xi. So uh, the unshell uh, conditions translates into the following equation, that the xi I plus one uh, multiplied by the uh, the lambda i equals zero. So um, as I said before, this pair of chiral and anti-chiral spinners, n pair of them, uh, are encodes all the kinematic information of the unshell uh, kinematic space for the n, part n masters particle scattering. Um, and um, alternatively, this coordinates x i and uh, the chiral spin at lambda i uh, also, uh, also encodes the same amount of information, and they form these. Uh, there are the, uh, the the variables um, in the dual, which spans the dual uh, uh, dual coordinate space. So you can express the amplitude either in terms of these angular spinners or in terms of the uh, of the variables in the dual space. Um, and in the dual space, there is extended symmetries uh, of the pure Gluon amplitude that has been discovered, which are the so-called dual conformal symmetry. Um, so you can define this uh, symmetry by writing down these, this inversion, inversion uh, operator. And the special conformal transformation is given by the, uh, uh, in the uh, action of the translation and, uh, and the inversion operator. Um, so the inversion operator acting on this coordinate space and is, is uh, given by the following equations. And this is just a conventional way to, to, to define the inversion operation. And um, the, these, uh, the inversion operation acting on the spinners uh, uh, <clears throat> The behavior is given by this equation, and this is the way we write down this equation. Uh, is is uh, uh, can can in this way such that these unshell conditions um, can be preserved. Uh, well.
So uh, after in defining this inversion operation, we can uh, take a look at how the amplitude transforms uh, under the special conform with the dual conformal transformation. So actually, we find that it transforms covariantly under the inversion operation, and hence the dual conformal transformation. So this this means we have found a dual conformal symmetry for the NHV amplitude at least. Um, so this comes with um, a, the, the reason why we have this enhanced symmetries uh, is a, can be explained by embedding this uh, pure blue amplitude in a uh, in a gauge theory, which has the maximum uh, symmetries called the maximally supersymmetric Young Mill theory. And in that theory, this degree of symmetries are extended to the supersymmetry and um, the supersymmetry, and, uh, uh, but the pure gluon amplitude in masses QCD and n equals four super Young Mills are exactly the same uh, at tree level. Um, so in the n equals four super young mills theory, um, people have uh, studied these um, extensively in the past decades. Um, and for the, in that theory, the MHV super amplitude uh, is dual to the non-polygon Wilson loops. And therefore the conventional conformal symmetry for the uh, acting on the Wilson loop uh, which translates into the dual conformal symmetry of the MHV super amplitudes. And in more ge generic uh, configurations, namely the more generic, uh, the spinner, uh, the helicity configurations beyond the MHV amplitudes, the super amplitudes enjoys a, a larger uh, symmetry, uh, symmetry called the super, dual super conformal symmetries. And uh, such enhanced symmetry turns out into a, into powerful tools uh, for the analytic study of the amplitude in animals for super young meals. And in that framework, it is actually possible to derive the super BCFW recursion relation, which can be solved exactly at tree level, and which gives us compact uh, expressions of the tree level uh, super amplitude. And from these expressions, one can extract the uh, onshell amplitudes for the massless QCD as a component of the super amplitude. So this is what I'm going to talk about uh, tomorrow. Um, so, so, so that's it for today's lecture. Um, anybody has any questions, please don't hesitate to raise your hand. Uh, thank you very much, Kai, for this very nice lecture. Um, yeah, we have 15 minutes uh, for questions. Um, feel free to raise your hand or just unmute yourself if you have any questions. Uh, so there's a, a question in the in the chat just asking for uh, references. Um, so maybe. Uh Post yeah, I can I can post this in the Slack channel later today. And I didn't see the question. Um, oh, that was just in the in the chat. Um, okay. Yes, I will post it later. I can ask a question if I may. Um, can you say a few words about? What happens to the spinner helicity formalism when you include masses uh, instead as the onshell condition? Um, for uh, for the masses, I am not an expert on this subject, but uh, I know that you can derive BCFW recursions for the for the mass uh, for the case with massive um, massive external particles. Um, uh, but I can give you references yeah. later. Yeah, thanks. Perfect. Thank you very much. Uh, okay, if, uh, if there are no more questions, then uh, for now we can we have a lunch break and uh, we'll reconvene at 1.30 uh, Central European time.
uh, for the first lecture by uh, Thomas. So thanks again, Kai, for the very nice lecture. Thank you.